Some people have problems telling the truth. This woman is one of them. She's called Emily Horn, also known as Emily LeConte, Emiliana Carmichael, Emma Baker, and Anna Matthews. Emily is just 30 years old, and she's already been married to five different men, but she never bothered to get divorced from any of them. The blokes are basically indicating they were led by their pricks. And as my, as my father says, more fool then. In 2003, after her fourth marriage, Emily was jailed for bigamy. She was convicted of the same offence in 2009, and she's on her way to court for sentencing. If she's decided that she's going to take some sucker for a ride, and she's done the crime so she does the time, fair play to her. I would doubt anything that she said, because I learnt from experience that at best, she exaggerates everything. At worst, it's out, outright lies. Don't put a flash in her face. You know she's epileptic. Not that I care more. Go on. I believe that she did love me, but she loved me in her way, not in a sort of a rational way that you and I or a normal person would love a person. Just move, for God's sake. Move, Vicky. Don't. It's stopping my way. Move, Vicky. Oh. Everybody I met while making this film talked about Emily having a relaxed attitude towards truth. It seemed as though it would be wise to accept nothing at face value. Emily is pure tabloid gold. A giddy mix of sex and deception that made her infamous for a while. The first question I put to her was why she wanted to appear in a film that would go beyond juicy headlines. To set the record straight, for the truth, there is no way I can be painted as some sort of Mary Magdalene, um, some sort of wronged woman. But the truth is nowhere near as bad as the tabloids have made out. In some aspects, maybe, to a certain extent, it's even worse. What do you think my chances are of getting the truth in this documentary? No better than 50-50. Emily can sometimes... She, she will either lie outright or she will tell you a truth and embellish it to something it just isn't. Um, she won't mean you any harm. She's, I think she's probably, it's almost like she's not happy with the life she's had, so she's trying to invent one that makes her feel like somebody special. This is my own letter to the judge. Dear sir, I'm sure that every person who comes before you believes they have special circumstances, perhaps even me. I lost over a decade of my life to mental illness. I have absolutely no intention of losing another decade. Lithium has given me back my sanity completely, and as an intelligent, educated woman, society must have the law, or there would be chaos. I hope my defence will prove that the only victim in this sorry affair has been the law, and for that I am truly sorry. My decision-making process may have been flawed due to the drugs, but my basic sense of right and wrong was not. Yours sincerely, Emily Horn. Emily, what's your reaction? Is a relief? I think the next thing I do is I should get a divorce. Can you just leave her alone? For God's sake. Yeah. She was given a suspended sentence. Was it her letter that did the trick? Or was the judge lenient after hearing about the difficulties of Emily's life? One thing is for certain. The court did not hear the whole truth that day. Freedom. 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 The man celebrating Emily's liberty is Wayne Harper her latest boyfriend. He knows all about Emily's past, but he's inclined to look for positives. Obviously, besides the obvious, she's good-looking, intelligent. Well, I'll get on great with her. I mean, we don't really have that much in common. Emily likes to read books. Last time I read a book, I was at school. <laughs> so, well, yeah, well, we do have a good time. <laughs> Wayne's quote, I love him enough not to marry him. I don't judge her. Whereas a lot of people do, they judge her by the things that she's done. Uh, everybody's done things that they regret. And 
I can just look past her. This is how they met. One night in 2008, Wayne drank enough cider to make him a bit wobbly. He cycled into a lamppost, damaged his eye, and was treated in hospital in Wolverhampton. And it was there that he met Emily, who had been admitted with abdominal pains. When Wayne was in hospital, we went to visit him, and she was there. And from that moment on, she was in your face, wasn't she? Then we went to see Wayne, we couldn't ask him anything about Abby's eye or anything was, because she just did not stop talking all the while we was there. And we came out and got, that was a nightmare. <laughs> and the first thing I said to Mum was, she'll come home with Wayne and she won't leave. And, <laughs> <laughs> and she did. <laughs> Emily has an undoubted talent for finding shelter. The Harper family heard her tale of sorrow and took her in and gave her lodging. But not everyone in the family thought that was a good idea. From the first day that I met her, I thought that something was wrong. And I said I'd have trusted her and I, and I still don't. But that's my opinion. I, everybody else has got their own opinion, but that's mine. She knew what she was doing. You can't marry five people and not know it's wrong, so... <laughs> Anita's suspicion was well founded. Before long, Emily was fibbing to her new family. She told them that her father was dead. That's what I couldn't understand. When you still blatantly lied about your dad... When, when you two out. both cornered me that night... It wasn't cornered. No. I just asked you straight out. Yeah. A simple straight out. The Is still alive, yeah, the it? problem I'd had was... Less than 24 hours after being raped, my father saying, you're on your own. As far as I was concerned, my father was dead. To try and explain that to a set of strangers, as you were at the time, was very difficult. And then, of course, you became my family. So how do you go back and say, look, I am sorry? I've been lying all the time. Yeah. I asked her one time about, oh, how, how's your father doing? And she said, um, he's, he's dead. So, right, so what, what happened then? Says so he got dad in a car crash. I didn't, I didn't ask any more questions because I thought this is another, uh, another lie. And I think in a way she was, she was killing people off. I think, I think, it's, I don't know if there's some kind of psychological condition, but it started to, I started to realise that she was always killing people off in a family. She said her sister died when she was 16. Um, she had to fight to get them to turn off a life support machine, something like that, but she used to cry over that. What did she but, say her sister died of? Um, I think she said meningitis. Yeah, I think I know where she got the idea of the meningitis one. Hmm. Really? Yeah, because I lost a brother to meningitis when I was very small. So I think that's a pretty cruel, cruel thing. I know you, find this, you probably find this difficult to believe, but at 12, I actually stood up for the truth and I fought very hard for the truth. By the time I got that sorted... <laughs> By the time I got that sorted... I've been fighting for the truth, I've been telling these men all these lies. <laughs> By, the time, By the time I got that sorted, my grandmother's cancer had gone terminal. There are some things about Emily's life that can be verified. There is, for example, a certificate confirming that she married Paul Rigby in 1996. I went and got married as soon as I turned 18. And then I pretty much realised it was a very, very big mistake. It was teenage petulance and teenage pride. But nonetheless, the commitment was made. Um, we never lived together, but then that was always understood. Paul was at Catholic training and would have been posted wherever the army sent him. And I was at Leeds studying. Emily left school at 16. She didn't have any A-levels, but managed to get herself a place at a university in Leeds. During her first year of study, husband Paul was convicted of a serious criminal offence. Put it this way. Would you want your friends to know that your husband had been part of a group of people 
that had murdered a 17-year-old girl who was four months pregnant and helped get rid of the body. That was the end of husband number one. 19-year-old Emily was all alone in Leeds. It wasn't long before she met the man who would shortly become husband number two. It was after a temping bowling night, I was a league bowler. So it was we'd played a league and I'd gone into my local pub just for a couple of relaxing drinks before going home. And she was working as a barmaid there. I'd never met a girl like her before. Everything I'd say to her, she seemed to know something about. She was intelligent. She'd pick up on things very quickly. Even temping bowling, you know, she took that up herself, even though she'd never tried it before. She seemed to be head over heels with me, and I suppose it, it didn't take long at all before I, I did fall for her utterly. She was just intriguing, beguiling, and because we were spending so much time together, I just became enveloped in her. She probably showed attention to me that, in a way that no girl had done before. You know, I'd had relationships before, but she seemed to focus 100% of her attention on me you know, all the time. And that's, that's very flattering, I guess. We'd been together perhaps two or three weeks when she first, men first mentioned marriage. And she said she'd come from a Roman Catholic family who didn't believe in a, a relationship without the idea of marriage, but she was very pushy on the idea of, of getting married because of the sexual relationship. I didn't know if I was coming or going. I didn't want to get married that quickly. Because no matter how in love with someone you are, you don't know them after two or three weeks. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, I found out I was pregnant. We'd already bought the dress anyway. With one of those bargains. We'd already been looking at rings. I mean, Sean had wanted to spend the traditional month's salary. Not my idea of a sensible way of spending money. I was at work one day and someone passed me a note Emily had phoned in and she'd asked me to meet me in a pub after work. Walked up to the pub on my own. Had a look around and couldn't see her. But one of the barmen came over to me. Said, there's something for you. And there was a note on the bar saying, you know what to do. There was a box with a note. Opened it up and there was an engagement ring in the box. So she'd been out and bought an engagement ring. I turned around and she was there. So... Yeah, put the ring on her finger. So we got married. Unfortunately, the pregnancy wasn't meant to be. That was in 1999. Ten years later, Emily told Wayne's family about another pregnancy. Within, like, two, three weeks of her being here, she came down the stairs really happy and smiling and told me she was pregnant. And I just... Mm. Basically being plied. I said, just said you'd better not be. <laughs> she didn't hard um, Vicky after that, did no, she? <laughs> we didn't get on at all for a few months. Um, basically, she had a miscarriage within a week. Mm. Two so weeks. she said. But she came into the wrong family to get away with anything like that. Look, I've had six kids. You work it out in your own head. You, you don't meet somebody, have sex with them one week, and three days later tell them they're pregnant. It's not difficult to see patterns in Emily's behaviour. For example, when she meets a new man who suits her requirements, she likes to get married very quickly. Into the new year, end of January, she was saying, kept saying, let's go down to the registry office in lunchtime, get married. No witnesses, no friends, no family. I wasn't going to do that. I wanted some friends there in, at the very least. Her family had big problems with each other. Her mother and father had divorced and wouldn't speak to each other. So she invited anyone from her family, there would be rows. And she didn't want to go to a wedding where none of her family were there, but all of mine were. 
So yeah, she asked if we could get married without any of my family there. In the end, we got married with just a few friends there. Almost immediately after getting married, very, very quickly, she seemed to change. She'd have nights away, no explanations as to where she'd been or what she'd been up to. Become far more demanding of me emotionally. She'd start making up obvious stories because each time I asked her, it was a, a different story every time. And I, I could only think that she was seeing somebody else, but could never get to the, the truth of it, never get her to admit it. What I didn't realise was um, bowling would always come first. Bowling? Yes, 10 pin bowling would always come first. You hear people talk about golfing widows or fishing widows. I was a bowling widow. Someone I knew from the bowling circle was building a bowling alley out in Norway. I think it was the summer after we'd married. And uh, he'd asked her to go with him to basically be his personal assistant out there, his secretary or whatever you go for. Emily made a couple of trips to Norway. Although she'd been married to Sean for less than a year, she began an affair with a man called Leif Arne Dals Glass. I had a fling. So you can't have thought much of Sean to be doing that? <sighs> Sean was in love with another thing. I had a fling. I was very young. You're asking me to comment on things now? Of course I would do differently. I'm ten years older and I'm ten years wiser. I was a teenager. And I misbehaved. How many 19-year-old girls do you know that are not cruel on some level? Emily's Norwegian romance came to an end when her lover refused to marry her. So she went back home to husband number two. And Christmas was great. And New Year was wonderful. And then I realised by about mid-February, nothing had changed. Again, she started having nights away, not being where she said she was going to be to meet me, just disappearing, no explanations. So then I decided fairly quickly that that, that was it, you know, it wasn't a marriage in anything but name. I took a job over in Lancashire, which would mean me staying over there five or six nights a week. And I said, right, if you take that job in Fleetwood, it's over. You know, I'm not going to be sitting here for six weeks at a time waiting for a phone call. You take that job, it's over. You took the job. And, uh, yeah, we, we did drifted about fairly quick. She's like... A predator. She's, she, she, you know, they're, they're her prey. She, she's done what she needed to do. She's found, all right, the naive men. Maybe they are mugs for believing her, but she's very good at what she does, and I, sh I wouldn't be proud of that. There always has been a double standard between the sexes, and we, it was in days of old, and it is now. And I'm sure everybody knows it. A promiscuous man is a jack the lad, and a promiscuous woman is a slag. And that's not right. Promiscuity is promiscuity. End of... And I would say to any promiscuous man that's watching this, you're a slag. Take some responsibility for your life, mate. Don't leave it all to the women. I hadn't actually seen her for a while when she turned up at the end of uh, March 2000 and asked me if, uh, if I'd go for a drink with her. And so I said, yeah, fine, I hadn't seen her for a long time, I thought there's, there's, there's nothing wrong in that. And we went, f went for a drink here at a sort of cafe bar in Leeds, and she told me that uh, the relationship with Sean was over. A colleague of Sean's, a guy called Simon Thorpe, had become a very close friend of mine. To be honest, I'd been in love with him since the moment I first saw him. But I was committed to somebody else, and I don't break my commitments. She then told me that she was leaving Leeds, she was going to get a job in the Lake District. And I was sorry to hear this news because of the friendship that we'd had. 
But I thought, well, you know, it's probably a good thing to leave Leeds because you don't want to stay here where obviously all the memories of that particular relationship. He seemed absolutely gobsmacked that my relationship with Sean was over. And I was somewhat upset. And I went down to powder my nose, so to speak, get myself under control. I came back and Simon said, don't go, I love you. No, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, I mean, the thing, the thing was, I mean, I, I wasn't in love with her before the relationship. I liked her, and, and, and you know, she was attractive in her own way, and she, you know, she, but I, I, I wasn't in love at that time. No, definitely not. It was later that evening that she, she uh, confessed that she'd been in love with me. I was a little bit embarrassed at first because I thought, well, what does one say? Because I thought, if I reject her, it's, it, it could be rather cruel. You know, she's a friend. But on the other hand, I thought, well, I get on really well with Emily. You know, we have this great friendship, we, we share a lot of common interests. I thought, give it a go. So I took the job in Grasmere. And Simon came up to see me that Easter. And he rented a holiday cottage. And from that Easter, right the way through to probably about November, it was the happiest time of my life. Taste of honey. I love Simon. I've loved him from the moment I first saw him. And I will love him to the day I die. Simon and I would have toured the world apart for each other. We did. Well, uh, what, what do I say, really? It was passionate, I'll say that, but I can't say it, I can't say it was a deep romantic love. It, it sounds a very cruel thing to say, doesn't it? I mean, the various degrees of love. I, can't, I, I did love her in my own way, but it wasn't... A, I wouldn't say it was an all-consuming love, no. She gave in her notice uh, the hotel and my parents very kindly uh, allowed us to stay in, in our house. It was a large Victorian house, so I had my own apartment really within the house. I had the attic rooms, so I had a sitting room and a bedroom. So I had a lot of privacy there really. We'd get a couple of bottles of wine. We'd get books out and we'd be arguing over Tennyson and Byron. Or we'd be bringing in more modern stuff like Dickens and the State of England novels. She's bright, she's very bright. I don't think she has a great deal of depth to her intelligence in, in any particular subject. She's one of those people, a bit like a magpie, she can sort of steal lots of ideas from all sorts of different sources. And she can very quickly read a book and sort of have a, a sort of superficial knowledge of a subject because she can talk about such a wide range of them, but she hasn't studied any subject in any real depth, I don't think. And I got a feeling that she honed in on my own interests, because she, once she realised what interested me, she did sort of start to take an interest in my own sort of interests. His interest was in the pre-Raphaelite era. Mine was Cretan de Troy and Mallory. I speak French, so I was able to translate them. The pre-Raphaelite was the Victorian a renaissance over Arthur and that kind of Lady of the Lake appeal. Whereas mine was, you know, when it was written originally. He wanted to be a Brownwell Bronte or a Tennyson, you know, almost a Mr. Darcy type character. So it was romantic? Yes. Very. Did he make big romantic gestures? No, he made romantic gestures. I wouldn't call them big. The best gift he ever gave me was a sunrise. But, as usual, when we had these conversations, she was doing most of the talking and I was just listening, going, yeah, and, and of course, Keats, yeah, OK. And I, I just couldn't get a word in, word in edgeways. Because she could just talk and talk and talk and talk. She just always talked about herself. She never really sort of engaged in a conversation with you. Or if she was, she just wanted you to listen to what she had to say. 
whenever he was talking about something, she'd just switch it round to like her encounter, and it was always something you probably heard like five times before. I got pregnant, completely by accident. I was on the injection, and uh, him and his mum frog marched me down St James's and made me have an abortion. There was no reason why we couldn't have had the child. <sighs> That's shocking. And then my, my mother certainly would not force Emily to have an abortion because it's got nothing to do with my mother. I mean, I, I know for a fact my mother's not that kind of person. She'd find it the idea of abhorrent. And I certainly wouldn't force her to have an abortion. I mean, that's, I just found that astonishing. Simon is adamant. There was no pregnancy and no forced abortion. Not long after starting to live with Emily, he experienced a vivid example of her fantasy life. She told me that her uh, sister had uh, died of a drugs overdose. And I'd actually met this particular sister, so I did know her very briefly. I was so shocked, though. Well, I can't, I can't work today. You're in an emotional mess. And it, it's affecting me. So I went to work and I had a word with my boss. I said, look, my uh, girlfriend's uh, sister's died of a drugs overdose. Can, can I have the day off? So we went to York and she told me all about what had happened and there was a funeral booked. She said to me, don't tell anyone about this. Don't tell your mother, your father, your sister, anyone about what's happened to Verity. I don't want anyone to know. So for the next few days, I was sort of like living with this kind of notion that her sister had died, and it was wearing me down emotionally, I have to say. And at one point, I, did, I said to my mother, I think it was the day before the, the supposed funeral, I said, Mum, can I just have a word with you in confidence? And I told her what had happened. I said, apparently she's going to the funeral tomorrow, so can you just keep an eye out for her? Then on the day of the funeral, when I came back from work, my mother pulled me to one side and said, Emily never left the house. Right. So I went upstairs and uh, she, where she was, and I, I said, how did the funeral go? And she, she, she told me about, you know, the events of the funeral, blah, blah, blah. I said, you're lying. So what do you mean? So you, you never left the house. And I said, of all the low things you can do, what a wicked thing to do, to, to make up a story like that. The emotional effect it had on me, notwithstanding the fact to use a poor sister as some kind of uh, emotional tool, uh, I, I was horrified. You told me once that you had a sister who died. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I'm not prepared to talk about that. Can you just tell me whether it's true or not? I'm not prepared to talk about that. Okay. Uh, because there are things that you said that, you know, they're quite big things. My view of... Oh, let's deal with this. My view of family is very different from ten years ago. Mainly, having spent a lot of time living with this family, I have been normalised, if you understand, reprogrammed. From 18 to 25, my only family were my friends. I was very lonely during my late teens, to a certain extent, and there was someone I was very, very close to. And it was a joke, we were like sisters. That was who I lost. What I said and how I phrased things five, eight years ago is very different to how I do it now. Do you expect me to go looking people up, running around and correcting things? It was perception. Poor perception, I would add. But you still do do it because you told Barbara and Vicky that your father was dead. That's for a completely different reason. My father and I had a massive falling out, very big, when I needed him the most. And he wasn't there. And I cut him out dead. I didn't want to have to answer awkward questions about my family. But that's quite a big thing to tell people that your father's dead. Isn't it? Yeah, and I'd appreciate it if you actually didn't tell my father. Great-grandmother was a femme fatale in Drury Lane. 
you look at her, a very early picture of her in the 1920s, and she was a very good-looking woman, there's no two ways about it, and I think she used her looks. She was in the chorus line at Drury Lane Theatre. And the funny part about it was, is, course, is that at the time it must have been shocking, but 80 years down the line, it's, oh, your nan was a bit of a character. And I think she kind of thought to herself, maybe I'll be a bit of a character as well. Emily is certainly a character, and a complicated one at that. She looks for the security of marriage, and then rejects it. And she tells a lot of lies. She lays part of the blame for her behaviour on being bipolar. Standard antidepressants take between 7 and 14 days to work. Lithium takes weeks, if not months, to work, to get into your system, and you have to maintain it. And it, it's almost like someone's put my mind back in. Someone's inserted the flash drive of my personality back into me. And the last time I remember thinking clearly, to a certain extent, I was about 16, 17. And, you know, you look, and then you turn back round and you look back over the decade and a bit of your life that you've just blown up. I mean, I look back at some things and I, I almost want to go, Oh my God, what was I thinking? How the hell could I? And I mean, that's not, I won't be the only bipolar depressive to think that's been through that. Look how big it is now, eh? Look at that. It's, it's still not big enough that can last another couple of days. Life continued pretty much as usual for Wayne and his family, even with Emily as a long-term guest. She had good days and bad ones. As the date for sentencing got closer, she seemed more prone than ever to making melodramatic statements. Four days. I'm counting. It's getting harder. But if you're expecting me to break down and cry, I'm not going to. alone or I cry in the rain I think that's one of the reasons I'm portrayed as so harsh is because I don't show that much emotion I only show emotion in situations where I'm not vulnerable and with people I trust completely and I've got that wrong a couple of times I can't help thinking that Emily's whole life has been about her getting things wrong, and that includes Simon. The intensity of feeling she expressed for him just didn't seem to be reciprocated. In 2000, they moved from his parents' house and bought their own place in Leeds. Things started to get difficult, and I think very quickly the, the romance was going from the relationship, really. The gritty reality of uh, living with somebody was destroying the romance of earlier. I think by September, I think the excitement was going for her. And I think it's probably round about that time that she, uh, she started to see uh, Chris Barrett on the side because she was, she was looking for the next bit of excitement, the next adventure. The following year, things came to a climax and we split up. But with, with me, really, because of the, the amount of problems that Emily had in her life and they were starting to affect me, there was a sense of relief for me when she, when she left. Of course, Emily was still married to Sean, the man she claimed had made her a bowling widow. He lost his job and returned to Leeds, broke and discouraged. I came back to Leeds quite distressed about the job, distressed about the marriage breaking up. Um, members of my family were ill then, and I was struggling really emotionally to deal with that and couldn't deal with anything financially without a job. So at that point, the house was in danger of, of being repossessed and I, I got to the stage where I wasn't even an opening post. Met Emily on the bus and explained the situation I was in with the house and that at some stage it was going to be repossessed. By then she was with somebody else that she'd met 
and she offered to move back into the house with him and pay the mortgage for a while till I got back on my feet. That's, I suppose, by anybody's standards, an unusual situation. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> Looking back, I can't quite believe it was going on. But I was in such, such an emotional state at that time that it seemed perfectly reasonable. Sean was in a hell of a state. Um, he blamed me for leaving him and the job falling through. So the fact that Chris and I moved into the top room was a practical one. Bills have to be paid. What was life like in the house of the three of you? It was okay. It was... I mean, it was very difficult for me if I saw them together and they'd go to bed or, or I'd go to bed and leave them downstairs. Those are difficult moments. Did he know that you were married no, to Emily? No. As far as he was concerned, I was an ex-boyfriend of Emily's and she'd asked me to keep our marriage quiet and just to say that I was an ex-boyfriend. Sean and I continued with me staying in the top room and me paying the mortgage until until I found out I was carrying Simon's baby at which point I mean it's difficult to explain the amount of pressure I was under Sean was blaming me for the fact that he was unemployed and Simon was less than happy over what I'd done with Chris and I was being pulled like a piece of elastic. So, she was living in a house with her second husband, Sean, but sharing a bed with boyfriend Chris, while still having an affair with Simon, a very modern arrangement which must have involved a lot of deception. Do you think that you have a different concept of truth to most people? It's an interesting one. Truth is for philosophers. Facts are undeniable. There's a possibility, yes. I most definitely had a conceptual problem with both five to eight years ago. We were still saw each other and we used to spend a bit of time together. We were never living together at this, uh, after that. Once she left uh, Well Street, we were never living together. But we used to meet up now and again. And we stayed on very good terms. And we, we had fun together, I have to say. I can't, you know, I'm not going to lie and say it was all bad. Having fun is all well and good, but Emily wanted more. She fancied another marriage, but Simon had always said no. He knew she was married to Sean out of revenge, almost, you know, kiss the other boy to make someone else look jealous. I married Chris Barrett, and I knew it was illegal. Chris was an innocent victim of, I wouldn't say a power struggle, it's the wrong word, a love that would tear the world apart between me and Simon. With the world remaining in one piece, Emily decided to celebrate her illegal marriage to Chris. She told me they were going to have a little party to celebrate the fact that they were together with some friends. I thought, yeah, that's fine. I don't really want to be there. That would be very awkward indeed. But they came home that night and, and they were married. And she told you we're married? She didn't. No, I saw the ring on her finger. Asked her if they were married. And I can't remember if it was Chris or her. Said yes, they got married that afternoon. Did you say anything? Did you say, but we're married? No, I didn't. I, as far as I can remember, I just broke down and ran upstairs. I couldn't believe she'd done that to me. Couldn't believe she'd done that to Chris. They seem to love each other. It's just earth shattering. 
the time that you were with Sean and you brought Chris into the house, uh, wasn't that just really cruel to Sean? Then he should have got a job and paid the mortgage, simple as. The house had to be saved, I was the only one working. It was... An... Fine, if he didn't like it, move out. I'll pay the mortgage. The mortgage needed paying, that was all it was done for. As to cruel or uncruel, I wasn't thinking like that at the time. I was thinking, oh my God, I've got to save the house. Had I not done it, Sean would have been on the street. I went over to uh, Raincliffe Road, where, where she lived with Sean. And I found a, a piece of paper on the bedroom floor which said, uh, Emily Barrett. And I knew that Chris, this Chris Barrett by name. I said, have you, have you got married to uh, Chris Barrett? He says, no, 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 it's, that's, uh, that's uh, his sister's name. I said, come on, I haven't just fallen off a Christmas tree. He said, tell me the truth. And she goes, yeah, I have. And I thought, Emily, what are you doing? What happened? I think a letter came addressed to Mrs Emily Cunningham. Chris asked her about it then. And was I just an ex-boyfriend or was I an ex-husband? And she told him that no, I was actually still her husband. And yeah, Chris was in the same sort of emotional state that I'd been in. Just utterly broken. I think she just knows how to pick them. I think she can look at a person, speak to them for a bit and know that if they're vulnerable or if, you know, she can manipulate them and stuff. I think she's really good at telling what people's characters are like and I think that's what she, like, looks out for, you know, in a man. She just tells them, like, that she's had a hard life and everything and they just want to try and make her life better, which in the end, they'll, she'll ruin theirs. Emily left Chris and Sean, and possibly Simon, in a state of emotional turmoil. And then she went to the train station. I got a train on the first job offer I got, which was Ipswich. I didn't even say goodbye. I met Emily on a train. Um, I what My job at that time was a train guard. She was dressed very sexy and it was one of those occasions that you notice people and she looked really nice. I had a conversation with her about the ticket. James was normal with a capital N. And that's very attractive when you've led an alternative lifestyle for a very long time. He was probably another innocent victim. She did seem to enjoy my company, she seemed to like talking to me, and guards have a sort of uniform so that you're aware that that has a certain attraction to certain types of ladies, which is quite nice, so it might be that she was attracted to the uniform. I invited him for a cup of coffee, because he just finished shift at the railway station. She went back um, with me to my place, um, and she ended up staying the night. Emily spent the night with James, and it was only a matter of days before she moved in with him. Once again, she'd found shelter. Of course it's an unacceptable behaviour. But the other side of the coin is, they let me move in, it's two sides of it. So part of their fault? Yeah. Or are they claiming they're absolute complete morons that can't write English? Past two GCSEs at grade C or above. James has a degree in economics. Sean has a PhD in physics. Do I carry on? No? All right. A nice looking body and uh, being a bit good in a sack. Shouldn't blow your mind off to such a, an extent that you hand over a set of keys to a stranger. It works both ways. She was very, very lively very, very interesting. Um, there seemed to be a lot of problems and a lot of things that hadn't gone well in her past. And she seemed to want um, stability, wanted to be with somebody, wanted a certain amount of happiness um, and, and a sort of stable life. He was a very, very Christian, very Christian. 
and I had been seeing him for about a week when I text marry me lol and then not being serious out of the blue I got a text message asking if she would um, if I would marry her which was a bit strange I didn't really know quite how to answer it um, I thought about it and I thought well I'm serious enough about her to consider marrying her. So I said yes. Next time I went back down two weeks later, he pretty much got everything arranged. She seemed to want to get married very quickly. Um, I was happy with that um, because I thought I'd found somebody that believed in the things I believed, um, somebody who wanted to be with me. Once the snowball starts, it's very difficult to stop it. Very, very difficult indeed. So I went ahead with it. So James became husband number four. Was Emily right when she said that the men in her life were led by the pricks? An adventurous young woman can have a powerful influence on an older man. She seemed to be very, very open-minded about the whole issue of sex. She was always wanting to do uh, different things, um, had different suggestions about what to do. She um, had no issues or problems with herself being naked in front of me. Um, and was quite happy to, seemed to be quite happy to do and try almost anything. Yeah, right, here we have two girls on the street now. This is uh, Bonnie. Hi. And this is Anya. Hello. Anya, I need to we only met about five minutes ago. We've, uh, these two girls, they don't normally hang out on the streets, do you really? No, no we normally, okay. our office, is the office is round. Right. Emily makes her own choices about earning money, and she must have had her reasons for appearing in low-rent porno films. She usually referred to herself as a porn star or a glamour model, but this seems a long way from glamorous, especially for a woman who likes to discuss the pre-Raphaelites and dream of romance. When Emily met James on the train, she told him she was a model. Only weeks after their marriage, he learned that she'd only disclosed part of the truth. I discovered that she was working at one of the local massage parlours. Um, she explained to me that how can she turn around to somebody she's just met and say, um, you know, I'm working at the local massage parlour. I could accept that because um, prostitutes have um, a bad reputation with everybody and people have a, a sneer at them and, and write them off. James has said that shortly after you got married, he found out you were working in his world's a massage parlour. Is that true or untrue? James found out I was working as an escort. <laughs> I was working as an escort and a glamour model in London. But James was aware of, of that anyway. When we met, I told him I was a model. I didn't specify what genre. But did he know you were working as a prostitute? By definition, please change your words. Escort, there is a difference. Escort, prostitute. No, there is a difference. What's the difference? For a start, an escort is paying for her time. What she chooses to do on her time has her own choice. She can say no. Prostitutes and massage parlour can't. That's the big difference. Okay, did you, when you were working as an escort, did you have sex with men for money? Of course I did, but I also walked away sometimes. But did James know about that, that you were doing that work? It's pretty much the same as glamour modelling. It's not a great deal different. Sex for money. Definition. No, glamour modelling is not the same as prostitution. Sex for money. Sex for money posing, in private. Posing for top, posing topless is not sex. Glamour model also covers adult film work. The genre. Porn star. Better word. (laughs) 
when you're married to four different men, and when your life is constructed of a series of untruths and fantasies, it must be hard keeping track of everything. Emily told me that with James, she came clean early on. I told him about a week later. A week after you got married? Yeah. It's so funny how none of them have a problem with it until they stop getting laid. If I can be so bold as to say that. They've all known within a week. I still don't understand why it is you got married five times properly. I know you've got a, a, an answer for each one, Mike. You, want you know, Chris really? was getting, getting back at Simon, but I, I don't understand why this need to get married. It isn't a need to get married. I can't give you an answer for an overall reason. Send me to a behavioural therapist. Maybe they can give you an answer. I have no answers. If I had an answer, don't you think I'd have stopped it? I can give you the reason at the time each one happened. The overall pattern. The closest I can get is what I told probation. When I'm unmedicated and unstable, inhibitions are lowered dramatically. You don't, you're not, you don't stop being yourself, but your inhibitions are lowered dramatically. I have no respect for the concept of marriage. It's a piece of paper. One in two marriages end in divorce. And of that one, an awful lot of that one is made up of people that were born in a different time when marriage did mean something. I do respect monogamy. I finally came to the conclusion that I needed to piece together what the truth was. And from that, I could then make a decision of what I was going to do. And one of the first things that came out when I started that was I discovered that there was a second marriage. I started to realise that there was no point in the marriage that I had because it was just a farce. We met up and we were on a train and we were talking and she said, and she put her tongue to the side of her cheek, as she does when she thinks that something's rather dramatic and funny. And she told me, well, the truth is, is actually another one. I'm actually married to three other, and you're the fourth. Which was a bit of a surprise, but by then I got used to her surprises. The person I thought she was, the person I loved, didn't exist and she didn't seem to care. James gathered evidence about Emily's other marriages and took his findings to the police. She phoned me up at the back end of 2002 and she told me she was going to court for uh, bigamy. And I thought, yeah, yeah, OK. I thought this was another one of her elaborate lies because she told me so many sort of uh, fantastic stories that I just thought, this is, this is another one, she's going to be in court. But Emily was telling the truth. She was convicted of bigamy and served a six-month jail sentence. But that didn't quash her enthusiasm for matrimony. In 2007, she met Ashley Baker in Oldham. We've recently found out that how he met her was actually in a massage parlour. So he his friend actually paid um, for her for her her time um, as a birthday present for him. But Emily's recollection of her first meeting with Ashley is very different. I met Ashley in Oldham on the seventh of May. We met at a rock club. We got talking, similar interests similar backgrounds, that kind of thing. We exchanged numbers, we met for a drink the following day, and we ended up in bed. Or would you like me to pretend I'm a nun? Ashley wouldn't take part in the film, but his two sisters, Lisa and Shelley, were close observers of his relationship with Emily. When he was with her, he was the happiest person you could ever see. Honestly, he was so smiling all the time, hands in hands, arms in arms, cuddling, sitting on each other, kissing, maybe too much, to be honest, in, in people's company. 
Well, they'd only been together a couple of months when she was supposedly pregnant, which we thought it was a bit suspicious when she said she was pregnant because she'd actually told him she couldn't have children. I asked my brother, was they using anything? And he said, no. So I was like, well, why not? And he said, well, because she said she couldn't have kids. So I was like, well, you'd still use something because, you know, you don't know. You've only been together two weeks. You don't know where she's been, you know. And then it was only then that she said she'd had the miscarriage and everything. And then it told us that she had uh, womb cancer and that she'd only had, like, she'd been told off the doctor that it was that far gone, that she only had about four months to live, that she was actually going to die. Um, and it was all secret. And then it was actually on our father's birthday that he mentioned it to my sister that in two weeks' time they was going to get married because he, he wanted to be married to her before she died. Ashley said that you told him you had womb cancer and you had four months to live. Did I? Really? That one scared me. You didn't say that to him? No. I got a letter one morning telling me that my smear test had come back and that I needed to have another one done. It's the second time it's happened to me. My grandmother died of cervical cancer. I get a bit jittery around it. I fell apart for a few days. The wedding was really tense. None of her family was there at all. And then when they turned up in like dark clothes and she had like a, a vest top on and jeans, which is a bit odd. If it's your wedding, you know, the other one you're supposed to have had up, you know, to our knowledge, then you want to make it a special occasion. So we thought that was a bit weird as well. The happy couple set off for a honeymoon in Scotland. But instead of love talk, Emily had something serious to say. She started crying in, on the way up to Scotland and he was saying, what's wrong? Um, and she said, oh, I've got something to tell you. I don't, I don't know whether to tell you. And he was like, well, you know, tell me. Eventually got out, got it out of her. And she said, I don't think um, my marriage is legal. The marriage is legal, but it, but it is in my heart or something like that. She said it was real to her and real in her heart, um, but it wasn't legal. Despite this knowledge, Ashley decided to stick by his bigamous wife. But when they moved in with his mum and dad, there were more revelations. She said she worked in IT. She said she worked in an office where she'd have to go in for like three days, you know, at a time. And she'd stay over. She said she she was one of them people who couldn't sleep and that she could she just have to work through it all and she couldn't stop her job until it was done. Three days at a time, yeah, um, and come back with lots of cash. My mum used to do all the washing and stuff and she'd have an overnight bag, you know, that she'd take to work with her. And one time I was there when my mum was doing the washing and she brought her underwear out and it wasn't like normal underwear, it was like negligee, you know, that was like really see-through and it was just like a piece of string, you know, with a bit of lace and stuff on. And I just said to my mum, oh, it was weird, you just wouldn't wear that sort of stuff to work, you know, that's something that you have, you know, like in a private bottom drawer or something, you know, in your bedroom. I think she was going working in uh, as a prostitute or an escort, to be honest. Ashley and Emily found their own place to live, but there were wildly different accounts of their relationship from that point on. I think because he loved her and the way they were, he always thought he could look after her because she said she had so many things wrong with the womb cancer. She said she had migraines, she was on antidepressants. And she'd also say to him, well, look, um, if you leave me, I'll kill myself. And he was worried for her and that's why he put up with it because they must have had good times as well as the bad times, so I think he just hoped on that they'd have more good times than bad. Look at the profile of standard domestic abuse. Ashley pretty much fit into that, fits into that. Along with blackmail. If you don't do this, if the police take me away, if you get me kicked out, I'll tell the police about our marriage. I lived with that. And I walked out at the end of May. I didn't walk out on the relationship. I just wasn't prepared to take a risk of any more bruises. It never, ever 
hit a woman. He knows if he ever touched a woman that how we'd react to it, all the family would react to it, because it's just not something you do. He's always been brought up. Like I said, he's got two sisters, and, like, obviously when we were younger, we used to argue, but then it never hit us as we got older, because it was always drummed in, you do not hit women. They got together in May 2007. They was married in September. And then she left him in June for his friend from work. It was devastated. It was really devastating because he still loved her because we were saying how he should have just left her to it, you know. After that. I know it's hard because he loved her, but we said, well, you need to just, if she's done that, if you take her back, she can do it again. Emily had left husband number five, Ashley, and started a relationship with his friend. That didn't last long either. And so one evening, Ashley went to see her to talk about reconciliation. He'd not slept with her for a month, and he was having an argument. She told him to get out, and he said, Right, Emily, this is, I've had enough. If I have to go now, then that's it. It's over. We're not trying again. Um, I'm going to the police about the bigamy. And she said to him, If I'm going down, you're coming down with me. So the next day... I text my dad just saying that, I wasn't coming over for tea, I wasn't feeling so good. My dad's old enough and wise enough to read between the lines. He came over and he found me. I knew by the tone of her voice that something was the matter. OK, Emily, what's the matter? Don't want to talk about it, Dad. Emily, what's the matter? Dad, that's just been round and raped me. Right, I'm on my way. And I called the police from where I live and I went straight down to her, where she was staying. She alleged that my brother raped her. And at the same time as giving a statement for that, she said, well, I might as well tell you now because you're going to find out anyway. And then told them everything. But they picked up my brother on bank holiday Monday, took him to the police station. He spent the whole day in the cell being questioned and took swabs and everything. And they found then there was no evidence at all and they quashed it. So That Sunday, I was taken to the rape suite. They did the usual tests. But there wasn't a mark on me. You can get to a state where you are so psychologically scared of someone. They don't have to leave a mark on you. I wasn't even sure it criminally constituted rape. Despite what she told her father, Emily refused to make a statement to the police saying that Ashley had raped her. For his part, Ashley denies any allegations of assault, sexual or otherwise. But I was aware of one thing. The only way I could guarantee my safety was to tell the police. So I did. Because I realised there's more than one kind of prison and there's more than one kind of hell. I think you've got to be a bit a bit twisted um, to do what she's done. But then she knows what she's doing, so then as a family we are angry with her, but I think a lot of people out there probably pity her. You know, that she's able to do all that and not actually lead a normal life. So we try for something a bit more classical and I'll try for a full length. Just relax. Okay, cross my left side. Nice, just relax, nice easy smile. You, you're amongst friends here, Emily. That's it, come on, you're at ease with the world. Your dad loves you, your whole family loves you. All right, nice one. I'll tell you what, Emily. Emily's life has been a turbulent one. She crammed a lot into her three decades. Five husbands, criminal convictions, mental illness, and a career as a sex worker. There doesn't seem to have been a great deal of joy in her life lately, but her father remembers her as a happy child. She was a textbook baby. She was bright, she was intelligent, she took in information very, very quickly. She learned to speak, or do all the standard things, speak, walk, talk, interact with people very, very quickly. As far as I'm concerned, father couldn't have wanted for a better daughter. I think that's a really nice portrait. That's a good one. Yeah, and you're happy with it? Yep, my eyebrows look great. When Emily was 12 years old, her parents separated. For six months after the split, Emily lived with her mother. She then 
made allegations of sexual abuse between me and my father. And I could have quite cheerfully wrung her neck over that. She knew it wasn't true, but it was something that would take time to sort out. And I guess by that time she figured she could uh, coerce me into staying. Marion's allegation wasn't outright sexual abuse about me abusing Emily. Marion's allegation was that Emily had consensually engaged in an incestuous relationship with me and that it was a conspiracy between the two of us. That's what, and she put it in paper via a solicitor's letter. And Emily was as brave as can be because she marched herself straight down the doctors and demanded an examination on the spot. For all that everyone says about me, there was a time when I stood and fought for the truth against the police, the social services, the family doctor, and I won. I was absolutely powerless to do anything about it, um, apart from of the obvious denials, of course. But Emily was never braver than when she, when she, day she did that. My mother was just being malicious. Or she was just trying to make sure that I could never go back to my father. North Yorkshire Social Services, whether they took any action on it or not, I later heard on the grapevine that they'd made some low-key inquiries and pretty much concluded there was nothing in it. I never, they never told me, bless them. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, it kind of lingers, does that? There's a nasty taste in the mouth. It's horrible. A month later, the next access visit, I left. And as I left, God forgive me, I backhanded her. And I think looking back on it now, in the benefit of hindsight, I think the gradual change in Emily's personality probably started from around then. Graham remarried, and Emily formed a good relationship with her stepmother. But by the time she was 16, her father was becoming concerned about her behaviour. She'd disappear for days at a time. She'd just drift in and out of the house. Again, she always came through the door, bright, breezy, like nothing had ever happened. Hang on, Emily, where have you been for the last few days? Oh, it's all right, Dad, it's no problem, just wasn't friends. Gradually, we just started to drift apart. We found out that she was starting to tell lies a lot. Um, we'd caught her out lying quite a few times. And she was starting to show signs of living in some kind of a fantasy world and it caused a lot of friction between us. It was like, I don't know, it was, it was a hard time. It was a hard time. And I got to the point in the end where I just wouldn't believe anything she said to me anymore. In that respect, Emily's situation hasn't changed much. The Harper family have heard enough tales to make them wary, but they've stuck by her, perhaps because of her relationship with Wayne. Wayne hasn't really had any girlfriends before. You know, he's been out with them, but he never seemed to bother, did he, Vic? He's never bought anybody over. No? At all. I think he preferred being out with his mates, even at his age. As long as she's with Wayne, she's part of our family, though. But whether, if she does decide to leave or anything on her own accord, um, whether she'll still want to know us after or not, I don't know, because I think she can move from one life to another. I think she's capable of doing that quite easy. I completely forget about where she's just been. Mm. Although Wayne and his family weren't happy about it, Emily decided she had to visit Simon before she was sentenced. So he got in a car and drove to Leeds. I'm nervous about the fact that every time I've gone up there as a, for the weekend to see him as a friend, I've ended up in bed with him. Whether or not I've had a boyfriend, it didn't matter. All the time Simon's single, he's a threat to me, as in my relationship. When I say I haven't really let go, it works both ways. There's a problem with my mind that makes me think I want security when really I don't. And how many times have I said I walk alone? Okay, what's that you've got 
it's Carl for Simon. It's, um, it's got a poem in it I wrote about three years ago. Basically goes, for love that tore the world apart, what am I to say? Like bards of old, be still my beating heart. Truly the light was sweet, as I consider our truth. You gave me the sun, and I gave you my youth. Yet let there be no bitterness and no regret. Let there be no hate to our end. Goodbye, my love. Farewell, my friend. We arrived in Leeds, and while Emily and myself waited around the corner, the producer of the film delivered the card and spoke to Simon. But he was busy writing a job application and wouldn't see Emily. Love, I don't agree with. You don't agree with love? No. Well, I uh, better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. I don't agree with. What do you mean? What does that mean you don't agree with love? I'm one person I should have uh, made the mistake with if you want to. <laughs> if you call marriage a mistake, I lost. For me, love doesn't work. You can love again in the future. Not like that. It should be not like that. In Emily's mind, Simon is the great lost love of her life, the Romeo to her Juliet. But she hasn't pined away without him. She finds other people to love, or other people she says she loves. In the past few months, I think I've had enough stress, sort of stress to last a, uh, last a life, lifetime. Mm. As to the future, it's unwritten. That's all I'll say. But do you think there's a future for you in mind? I'm not going to say. I don't know. Let's just say I'm rapidly running out of patience. But I also have a bit more understanding. I don't know. I think the next thing I do is I should get a divorce. Emily served a jail sentence for bigamy in 2002, but then she got married again. So prison was clearly not much of a deterrent. This time, she escaped prison. But should she have been punished? Well, her life seems so chaotic and dispiriting that she probably needs help rather than punishment. She says the only victim was the law, although Sean, Chris, James and Ashley might disagree. And as for the truth, well, it seems as though the truth will always be a casualty, where Emily's concerned. Freedom. 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 I think that my behaviour has been abominable. I'm wrong. I went one mistake too far, for whatever reason. And that has taken into account illness. And I paid a very high price. And it's over. <laughs>